Hi, and welcome back to our almost weekly Risk 5 Rust and Orboot hacking streams. So today we want to look at the DRAM initialization code that I translated from the C implementation of the vendor to Rust again. Um, not too much in detail though, uh, there will be an issue to discuss. And well, then we will also have a look at the second Vision 5 board again, uh, which had been announced and the first people actually had already just received theirs a few days ago. Uh, but first, uh, let's have a look at the news again. So currently running is the RISC-V Summit in San Jose, uh, which uh, had just started. So you see it's uh, December 13th and 14th. So that would be yesterday and today. And in yesterday's session, uh, quite some vendors had already announced uh, some new chips and stuff. Um, so let's just uh, look very briefly here at the schedule. Uh, there were a bunch of sessions actually. So most of them were like, uh, you know, keynote style and uh, mostly, uh, to be honest, it was more like marketing. So it was a bit less about, you know, any technical details or internals. Uh, although there were some uh, talks which are, uh, you know, quite interesting. Uh, let's pick a few examples. So, uh, for example, this one here uh, by Ulof Kindgren. He's uh, talking about his uh, Surf 32 bit core. So that is a RIS-5 core he implemented, which is openly available. Um, then there is a talk by, hang on a second. Uh, let's search for Heinrich. Heinrich Schuchat from Canonical. Uh, he's uh, working on integrating RISC-V support in uh, the Ubuntu distribution. And he is actually writing here that Ubuntu made RISC-V first tier. Um, not, not here, but I think it's in the full summary if you follow the link here. Um, yeah, then there is a bunch of other talks. So to be honest, I'm not really tracking this here. Uh, because it's like, uh, you know, mostly happening uh, offline over there where you need to pay quite some fee, I think, uh, if you were to attend online. Um, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't really done that. Uh, I mean, you could check whether you wanted to sign up if you wanted, but I guess it's uh, <laughs> yeah, a bit late now. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm uh, excited to see what comes out of that. There is also this here, which is interesting, uh, the progress in porting Android to RISC-V uh, by someone from Alibaba. So Alibaba made the processor core that is, for example, in the uh, all winner D1 SOC. And also, and with that, I would like to show something again, the BL808, the chip by Buffalo Lab, uh, which is based on the C906 core. That's the very same core I was talking about. And I just recently uh, received a few uh, boards myself. So let me quickly show you. Um, one of them is uh, this here, uh, which is, featuring quite a large display. So as you can see, it's uh, almost the size of my hand. And on the back is a module which carries the actual chip. So that would be this here, uh, this square shaped module here, which is about the same size. I haven't yet measured it, but it reminds me very much of the boards I've seen in uh, surveillance video camera. So yeah, I think that's also the market they are going for here. Uh, this board is also equipped with uh, two image sensors and also uh, an infrared sensor for, you know, uh, sensing uh, if, uh, if it's too dark outside, for example, and then, you know, you would uh, use some infrared or whatever. I'm not sure how it works, uh, but that would uh, enrich the image again. Um, and then, well, as you can see, uh, there is a bunch of wires hanging out here. Uh, because it has a bunch of serial ports actually, which are connected to the several different uh, different cores that we have on this chip. So there is uh, this one C906 core, but there is also an embedded core. And well, there is another uh, UART connector. I haven't yet uh, added more wires to it, uh, which is for, uh, you know, um, some, some sort of protocol that you could put on that device. Yeah. So that will be uh, one of the next targets also for Orboot. However, I'm still waiting for uh, more boards to arrive, which would be based on this here, of which I already got the SOM, the system on module. It's very, very tiny. So it looks a bit like the ESP, uh, the Espressive SOMs, if you know them. So they're like, you know, uh, small microcontroller units usually. 
Um, however, this one here also has this uh, more capable application core, which is on the other hand, not really connected to uh, most of the peripherals, which is a bit interesting, uh, you know, regarding the whole design here. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for uh, the full boards, which have this here and another breakout board. And then I also got some, uh, you know, uh, more equipment with that. Um, that should be arriving also, I don't know, in a few weeks, maybe as a Christmas present. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's that. And uh, with that, I would like to look at another board uh, that just started shipping recently, uh, the Vision 5.2. So if we look at this here, uh, this is rvspace.org. On rvspace.org, you will find some documentation. So as you remember, we don't have full documentation, but some documentation on the SOCs uh, coming from star five. And uh, the current one that we're working with is what we have on the left-hand side here, the JH7100, that's the chip and the Vision 5 board. By now, I think we could just say Vision 5.1. So just to distinguish it from the Vision 5.2, which is based on the successor SOC, the JH7110. And well, uh, not only have the first people received their boards recently, but there were also some sources showing up on GitHub for, uh, you know, the um, implementation of uh, early bootloader, uh, which in, in this case here is U-Boot, and uh, also an implementation of the Linux kernel, uh, I think, um, and a bunch more. So, yeah, uh, so from what I can see right now, uh, you can already build uh, everything that you would need to uh, boot a system and run a Linux kernel uh, on this uh, SOC and well on the Vision 5.2 board. Now what's interesting is, and that's uh, one thing we're going to look at a bit more in detail later, I looked at the sources for the DRAM initialization and let's actually have a very quick look here and I want to look at something called uh, DDR5, uh, DDR5 start.c, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's the one. And in comparison here, this is from the JH7100 DRAM in it. Uh, there was a very similar thing called recconfig pi start. So I still don't know what the pi here is for. Uh, it might be negligible. Um, it might actually also mean something, you know, uh, I, I don't know, just some internal abbreviation. Um, but what it actually is might be something that we find in other files, uh, again, in, in this U-Boot uh, repository here. But that's not too important right now. What I want to point out is the following. If we look at this here, so these here are uh, values being written to the controller and we look at that one here in comparison. You see these values here? Hex 5.1, 0, Hex 5.1, 0, and so on. Then we have Hex uh, 10K, 1, 1, 1, 200, 400. And now let's look at this here. 51, 51, 51, 51. Uh, well, and uh, if we just uh, keep reading on here, uh, we will see that this here is uh, that we have the 10k, 1, 1, 1, 200, 400. As you can see, it's very much the same, va uh, the same values which are being written here, which tells me, um, so first of all, it looks like they're using the same DRAM controller, but also uh, the same DRAM part. So like, uh, you know, the, the there is like different uh, DRAM chips and on the Vision 5 here, the Vision 5.1, uh, we have some LP DDR4. So LP, I think, is low power, and DDR4 is like the fourth uh, generation of the DDR standard. And so if we, uh, you know, if we are confident that this year is very, very much the same, we have another source of reference to look at. So, yeah, if you recall from last time, we were having some trouble uh, with our code, maybe. Um, so that is something to check on. And so, yeah, I also, um, I also went around and looked at uh, a few more things I could figure out about DRAM. Uh, one thing is very, very interesting. So uh, first of all, uh, 
the Denali thing that we read here over and over. So that is a, um, well, it's a product name actually, and it's coming from this company, Cadence. And Cadence, besides another company, it's like one of the main provider of, you know, all these peripheral controllers that you find on, uh, on a chip. Um, the other one would be Synopsys. So Synopsys is also very, very uh, famous. For example, they are making, I think, the uh, designware products, and those are very famous for, uh, you know, all, all sorts of uh, different buses also. Um, so yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, this here won't really help us, right? Uh, I, ju I just wanted to point this out a bit so that you know that, you know, uh, this market here is also uh, a bit small, right? So it's like roughly two companies for the entire world. <laughs> it's, it's not like there are two local companies or anything competing on a, uh, like a, in, a, in a few countries, but it's actually really all around the world. Um, what we can see here, they do have some diagrams, so we can get some more understanding of what is going on in DRAM. Now there is something more I found, which is very, very interesting. And I got to dig this out again, because uh, it's, uh, I have it on YouTube. Um, hang on a second. Uh, so there was somebody uh, who made a very, very nice video uh, around DRAM, explaining to us what DRAM is and how it works. We're not looking for this year. So this year is coming from microchip technology. Uh, so we're not interested in microchip. They're also one of the uh, chip vendors out there. Uh, we're actually interested in something else. And I think, no, it's not computer science. It was something else. Let's search for how DRAM works. There we go. This one here. It's a sponsored video, so uh, it's been sponsored by, I think, Micron. So Micron are uh, one of the, again, very few providers uh, who actually make memory chips. I think there is like three or four or something. So Micron is one of them. Uh, Samsung, also very famous. And then, well, a, f a few others. And then there's like, you know, a, a bunch of um, secondary brands, but, you know, the actual uh, manufacturer is uh, mostly the few ones. So yeah, this here is very, very interesting. I will put a link in the show notes so that you can also watch this uh, if you're really interested in, you know, the internals of how DRAM really works. Um, but then again, it does not tell us how exactly one of the DRAM controllers works or, you know, the specific one that we're currently dealing with which is the hard part, right? So yeah, we're not going to figure this out too easily. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, we do have some code and some comments. So sometimes you're just saying data something, but there are also comments like this one here, for example, right? Where it says uh, set to frequency, copy zero. Yeah, sometimes it sounds a bit weird. Um, sometimes you may be able to make sense of it a bit. Like this year, RD level, VREF, voltage, reference voltage, and I don't know, could be read level or something. Turn off multicast, you know, things like that. Anyway, the last thing I want to look at in comparison, and uh, that's about the code size that we're dealing with here, is what Intel are providing. And uh, they call it the FSP, a firmware support package. And FSP is essentially a collection of binary blobs with a few header files, and those header files are the interface to calling into those blobs. So this is where you know you pass a bunch of parameters. So there, um, there is usually a file like this here, .fv, uh, also .fd. Uh, we can look at that very briefly. I think this is short for firmware volume. So that's a concept from UEFI. It's uh, you know sort of like a, a file system or or a volume. There is a file system in there actually. So yeah, FV or firmware volume is defined uh, in the UEFI specifications. As you can see, this here is now 152 kilobytes, so it's even larger than what we had from uh, our vendor here. So we had, I think, 80 something. So this here is almost twice as large again. Um, yeah, it's uh, binary data. So if I uh, you know, were to click on view raw, we would just see some garbage here. Uh, not very useful to us. Um, this other file here, .fd, 
I think FD is for like um, something uh, like uh, also like a disk image or something. Now here you can see it's one megabyte in size and I'm not sure which is which or what it exactly contains, but there are sort of, uh, you know, um, there are actually multiple binaries in there. So FV, firmware volume, I told you it's a bit like a file system. If you open up one of those files, uh, then you will actually see that it contains more and more. And uh, we can um, take a look at one of those files in the uh, Fiatka firmware editor, uh, another project I'm also working on. So here you can just open a file, select it, and let's go to my downloads directory uh, where I have some download of an FSP. So this here is like 454K, and as you can see here, uh, this here is a directory listing. Uh, we can shrink it like this here, and you see it's a bunch of files in here. On the right hand side you can you can see a bit um, like uh, you know how much of the uh, how much of the file is actually really in use. So everything that is read here is used blocks. So those are 4K each. And then this here is uh, you know free space. So that's um, 430 kilobytes uh, in total and uh, yeah it's about two third used. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't want to dive into that too much. Uh, I might actually uh, go on and do some uh, streams also uh, where I'm working on the Fiatka editor. Um, however, uh, yeah, our main fo focus here is still Orboot. And uh, so, yeah, we will get back to that now. So, yeah, um, just just one thing I wanted to point out again. So you, you already saw the binary sizes here. Um, the header files coming with it are this here and there is something uh, called HOB in uh, you know in Intel's world or uh, what they want to define in UFI that is for handover block and you know that is essentially like a, a bunch of data that is being passed around from uh, one stage to another stage or one component to another component in the boot flow so as you can see uh, you know there is a bunch of those and uh, one of those files here is also about the uh, memory initialization. And here we see there's a few FSP files. So the file I just showed you in the Fiatka editor was an FSPS file. S, if I'm not mistaken, is like um, for like silicon in it. And I think it's like, you know, like the SOC. There is also this year T. I'm not sure uh, what T is. I think it's sort of like, you know, when you don't have the um, DRAM yet, but you, you, you need some sort of memory. And uh, this here would be like doing some early initialization using the cache as memory. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So yeah, uh, may, maybe you want to read up on this. There is also some documentation coming with this. Um, now the interesting one for us is FSPM. So M here is definitely short for memory. And if we look at that, uh, we see, well, quite a bunch of uh, lines of code. Um, I'm just scrolling down to the very bottom here. We're in line uh, 3600. And here you can roughly see, uh, you know, this, uh, this is essentially a giant data structure being defined here. And it offset almost uh, 1K hex. So 1K hex is 4K in uh, decimal. Um, that is about the size we're talking about, right? So you're passing around 4,000 kilobytes of data just for configuration. That is not even the implementation. So the code we are currently dealing with is uh, in comparison still a bit smaller, uh, but then again, it's already very, very much. And uh, you know, given that we don't really have documentation on that, it's a bit hard to deal with. And with that, uh, let's actually get back to the code. So I want to um, point out a few things that I just uh, did after our last stream and during the uh, days in between. So here you can see this is my uh, git history. You see there is a bunch of commits. Um, this here is from uh, the last stream that we had. That was the 30th. Uh, today is the 14th of December, right? So uh, this here is uh, the last commit I made on that day. And I was running into this issue where I was thinking that um, the DRAM remapping uh, doesn't really work. So there is a um, there is a data in memory 
which is essentially just uh, you know the uh, copy of, of another one, um, but it has different caching behavior. And uh, for that, uh, let's actually look at the uh, memory map again. So uh, this here, this is the memory map of the chip we're dealing with. And let me just zoom in a bit. So here we see the different base addresses, for example, the, uh, I don't know what we're using. Yeah, this is something we're using, for example, um, 1800 quad zero, uh, that would be the start of our, uh, you know, our SRAM, the static RAM. Uh, here it's called uh, int RAM zero, internal RAM zero. Uh, it's really just static RAM. And then there is a bunch more like uh, ROM, for example, ROM here means um, that is the uh, mask ROM. So that is uh, the code that is initially running, even if we don't even have any spy flash or whatever, or anything loaded in SRAM. This is always the first code running and it's checking uh, on conditions um, whether it should start executing code from here or offer a protocol or execute code from uh, somewhere else. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, I just zoomed in a bit more. Uh, I guess it's easier to read then. So what we want to look at is down here. And the first line is this here. So this is 10 quad zero quad zero. This is the start of the DRAM space. So this is now after we initialize our DRAM, uh, we can write to this area. And let me tell you, that actually works from what I can tell right now without any trouble. However, this is the non-cacheable RAM and what Linux or also the uh, U-Boot implementation from the vendor uh, would expect is to be running from a different space and that would be here. This is 8000 quad zero. And if, you, uh, you know, if you've uh, seen this before, it's actually very, very typical to you know, have this like uh, common uh, base address, if you will. So yeah, this is also where Linux would expect to start from, or usually it would start from 80, 20, quad zero. So if you look at the Linux configuration, it's like uh, sort of hard coded in there. Um, now this says it's the off chip DRAM also, and it's the same physical memory with a system port and uh, that is uh, also written here. So here it says non-cacheable, it's remapped to this address, right? So it's saying the same thing. Now, the difference is this year is cacheable and also supports atomics. So yeah, the C here is for cacheable. Now the question is, is it the cache that we're having uh, problems with? And so far I couldn't really figure it out to be honest. As you can see here, uh, we have a bunch more commits. So besides that one here, where I did some very early tests, uh, I actually had to fix a few more things. So one more thing, I, I was a bit surprised last time um, when I was, uh, you know, when I was reading from the spy flash, uh, I, I thought I was reading U-Boot. I wasn't really sure with the offset and I uncovered the mystery. So I actually got it wrong at some point. Um, I was using this year, I thought uh, OpenSBI. So yeah, this is like, one blob where you have OpenSBI and U-Boot uh, in like one thing. Um, I thought it would be uh, here, however that was wrong. Um, well, I, okay, here I just did the renaming. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what I got wrong. So I wrote spy flash base. This is already a subsequent uh, patch. So yeah, don't mind that too much. I had a one in here. So I was already off by, uh, you know, uh, quite an amount. So that would be uh, 10K hex or uh, uh, four times 16, um, that would be 64K, right? So yeah, I, I was already off by quite an amount. So yeah, that's uh, why I was uh, somewhere in the middle of reading data. So yeah, that is fixed now. So the, um, the code that is, uh, uh, that contains U-Boot and OpenSBI is actually in uh, this space. So starting at SpyFlash base plus hex 40K. 
All right, so yeah, as you can see, I did a bunch more commits and let me show you right now uh, where I am. So this here is uh, the current code on the right hand side. Uh, we have the main file. Let's make this a bit larger. Um, and this here is where we start with the DRAM initialization, which is all good. Uh, now I'm, you know, using a, a few uh, constant variables here. Um, they just uh, make it a bit easier uh, to work with this. Hang on a second. Sorry, I just sneeze. So yeah, uh, that makes it a bit easier to uh, uh, work uh, with, with a few things down here because there is, um, you know, a, a bunch of things where I, I had to play ping pong a bit. So I implemented something so that we could load our own second stage that we implemented uh, from SRAM. So uh, we, we just called the stage main. It doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's just some payload that we can uh, load from our own SRAM, which is just at some given offset. Um, and so now if I'm setting this variable here, uh, load main, if I set that to true, uh, then this part here of the code would be executed and uh, well what this does really is it's just a reading from from here or, or rather here it's doing that uh, it's ready uh, it's reading from uh, the main blob base so our main blob would be our own main stage and then just iteratively you know copying uh, the bytes from each and every offset uh, 32 bits at a time so that would be four bytes or one, one word size here, in, in this case, it's 32 bits uh, each. Now, if I don't set that, uh, we're executing this part of the code down here. And uh, well, I went a bit uh, like back and forth uh, with a few experiments here. I'm dumping a lot more data here in between uh, for you know every like uh, eight times four K. So that would be each uh, 32 K step and I started, you know, printing some like arrows, for example, for uh, loading progress. Well, and after everything is loaded, I would uh, do this again and, you know, dump a bunch more uh, addresses again, or well, 32 bytes at a time from uh, each of those offsets here. Now we can observe something and I will run an experiment again now to uh, show this to you. So first of all, let's look at the configuration. Um, there is two more things we need to mention. There is this here, load adder. So that's the load address where I'm loading the code to. And I'm using DRAM base one. So DRAM base one is the uncached memory base. Sorry, no, it's the it's the cacheable memory base. So if we look at this here, this is where the I just jumped to the definitions. So the uh, cacheable space is this here with the eight starting right and the uncached one is the one starting with 10 and then lots of zeros so yeah um now i only conditionally uh do a bunch more prints when i'm writing to this uh, cacheable space and that is because this is where i'm you know actually observing uh the issues so yeah um I also printed uh, a, a bit more information uh, each and every step. So a, a step here, uh, where is the step being used? This here. Oh, sorry, that is not for printing more information. This is where I'm uh, I'm trying to just flush the cache. So there is some cache coherence issues on this SOC, uh, but it's actually just related to DRAM from what I saw in their documentation. So I'm not really sure. I'm not even sure if this here is correct. Um, but yeah, I, I just tried it and uh, well, unfortunately to no avail. So <laughs> yeah, there is still something else going on which uh, we haven't figured out yet. So yeah, that is one thing I'm doing. Uh, the other thing is this year. Um, so the DRAM test code that we have for, you know, when um, uh, even just before this year, but uh, when we have just initialized our memory, uh, we're running this code. I refactored this a bit and uh, extended it. So yeah, I'm, I'm testing a bunch of memory ranges here. 
and I will now do something. So we're not running the full test, but we're just testing one range because it takes quite some time. Uh, and, and this here actually works uh, just fine, so so far at least. Uh, so I'm going to say false here for not running the full test. And now let's file this up and uh, actually see what happens. So yeah, I'm uh, quickly turning on the board again and building and here we go. Yeah, it might be that I will need to restart a few things here. Um, usually this should actually be waiting for me to press the reset button again, but uh, yeah, I don't know, we, we will have to see. It, it's a bit funky sometimes with the setup that I'm having here now. So I, I did switch eventually to uh, this double uh, USB serial converter because yeah, I wanted to get rid of some mess again here. Yeah, as you can see, nothing is happening. It says firmware update completed, but nothing happened. So I'm going to cut off the USB serial again and turning it on again. And we're going to re, uh, repeat the procedure. Yeah, that looks uh, just fine again. I'm just clearing uh, the leftovers uh, from the uh, serial here, well, or from Minicom. Yeah, so we did have to increase the uh, size of the blob that we're transferring now because um, if you remember this, our binaries are now significantly larger with the DRAM in it. So we're currently at seven, uh, 27K uh, plus our main stage. So our main stage is just very small. Uh, but anyway, it's still a bunch of code. Now this here is doing um, slightly more extensive test and okay I'm just interrupting this now because I want to show you what happens now so let's scroll back up here and, and see what was actually going on so yeah this is where it's starting the DRAM test is done it looks fine uh, I'm printing this here uh, which is already sort of pointing out uh, part of the issue but more on that later so yeah, this here is now from the loop where we're copying data from the spy flash to the DRAM. And we're observing the following. So it's copying the first four bytes here. That looks fine. And that is the very first iteration of the loop. And then I'm already printing this. Now, a bit later, this year uh, at hex 8K, I'm printing again. And as you can see here in the beginning, suddenly we only have zero. So we're losing our data. And I don't know yet why. Now the rest of the data is being copied just fine. Um, this year, well, it is zero. It should actually be, if you ask me, just FFFF. I will come back to that again in a bit. But now let's see what goes, uh, what's going on when we just keep continuing. So now this data here is also gone, right? However, in turn, we have uh, some more data here. So this year is new. Uh, you know, this year is again just the very first bytes again. So it's always like um, after. Uh, after a given offset and then one iteration, that's where we're printing. So we always see the beginning here. Now we continue with this process. And at some point we see, hey, hang on. Um, I guess this year, yeah, it might be that this year is truly actually zero. That would be okay, right? So it can be that there is actually some zeros in the binary. Now we keep continuing and uh, well, what do we see? Oh, look at that. More data is gone. So yeah, this here is at a much, much, made, much, much later offset. Uh, this is like 20K hex. This is 28K hex. And now when we keep running a bit more, everything is empty. 
but we don't even see anything showing up down here. And that is quite mysterious. So now I want to do the following. Um, that was the C code, sorry. I now want to uh, I now want to load to the second DRAM base and now I want to see uh, the whole thing again, right? So we're again printing for each and every step and so on. And let's just check that we're not uh, missing some condition somewhere. Um, yeah, that looks just fine actually. So now let's run this code. So let's clear that and see what happens now. Uh, what should be happening now is that it's actually filling up the data and uh, the empty space is actually not uh, filled with zeros but with Fs. And yeah, I, I will then show you in the code why it should actually be F. And maybe, maybe, we would actually need to walk through the code again. Um, maybe we need to do some flushing uh, before even starting the copying process. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure even if, if that would help at all. That, hang on a second. So it's starting the DRAM training. That is done. Testing is now also done. And now it's copying. And as you can see, I just canceled the process it is happily copying data and it's actually you know, filling things up. And here we can see uh, these zeros here that we were seeing, they're actually just fine. And as you can see, everything from the beginning uh, is actually being filled, you know, just, just as it should. And I have a suspicion that it's just part of the binary that this here is, you know, all zero at some point. That is just fine. I don't really mind that too much. Now, what is interesting is um, we're already seeing data down here. Where does that data come from? It doesn't really make sense to me right now. Right? And, uh, well, let's scroll up a bit and see if we would already have been there. So here we're writing to 20k hex. Here we're writing to 28k hex. But this here is a much, much later offset. So yeah, this is like uh, 10 times as much. So this is like 2e something. So it could be that there is still something being very, very funky here. And maybe, maybe what we're seeing here is actually from the previous runs where we were writing to the cacheable DRAM and now out of a sudden this data is showing up. Which is a bit strange. So yeah, really, really strange. Now up here, you know, we, we had all these zeros. Now this here is happening. And as you can see here, even for the first iteration, we already have some data here. But it's somewhere, you know, in, in the very end of the, uh, well, not, not the end of the DRAM space, but, you know, uh, much, much later uh, than the beginning, which is where we start writing. And so the question is, how that happened? Well, I guess we won't figure it out too easily. Um, and if we look at this, uh, do we see a pattern here? No, actually not. Um, yeah. What we can do is, um, well, we could log from here when, once we get there. That would be one uh, possibility. Uh, or we could just log again when we encounter, uh, you know, this very, very byte sequence uh, that we see here. Um, so th that would maybe help us get a bit more of an understanding. 
Um, what I can also tell you is if I power off the board now and I power it on again and then I run this again because I've done this before, then actually this year we'll be starting with all F. And now let's have a brief look at the code again to see uh, why it would actually be all F. So our test code uh, on the left here, this is writing different test patterns, right? And the test pattern that we're writing, uh, where is it? Yeah, that is here. So the first pattern that we're writing, so we're writing this to like a, a bunch of uh, places in memory. The first pattern is A5, A5, and so on. Next one is 5A, 5A, and so on. Then we have 0, 0, 0, and so on. And then we're writing all F. So my suspicion is that the cacheable DRAM is returning this year from the previous writes. And well, there is one way of figuring this out, right? So let's fill this with all seven. As you can see, I'm now doing this here where I'm writing to both the uncached and uh, the cached DRAM. And so let's change the load address again to the uh, the cacheable uh, space just to be certain that there is uh, you know uh, nothing left in, in memory I'm now turning off the board so I'm you know I'm, I'm waiting a, a second now for uh, the DRAM to be fully empty now I'm pouring it on again and we're running this code again And now let's see what happens. So if we now start seeing lots of sevens, then I think uh, we're actually having some caching issue here. And it would be very, very good if we could figure out how to turn off the cache because it's uh, you know just getting in our way and it looks like DRAM is losing our data, but maybe that's actually not happening. It's just a bit slow or something. Yeah, it's, it's a bit strange. Let's see what happens. So yeah, the initialization is now done. The first test is now done. And now we're loading some data. And as we can see, we're getting a lot of zeros again. So yeah, my guess was apparently incorrect. Now it could be uh, that the cache is being initialized with the zeros, but yeah, I don't know because I don't have documentation. Um, yeah, but we still see the same behavior as before, right? So here we had some data, then it looks like we lost it. Yeah. Now let's do the following actually. Um, I would like to try this. Let us skip or let us, let us dump some memory even before loading. So before we copy anything, and what I would like to see is, I would like to see if uh, we're now getting something which is, you know, not just Fs or zeros, if we do this here. And for that, oh, we're, we're now using load adder, and we're, you know, dumping a few regions. And this here is, uh, this is the one where we saw some interesting behavior. So yeah, let's, let's do this here. Um, I, will, I will stop the process very early. And then I want to also change the load address again uh, to the uncacheable space. If I'm confusing things sometimes, I'm very sorry. It might be that I'm saying uncacheable when I mean the cacheable space or something. Um, that is not intentional. It's just, you know, uh, all the stuff here is very, very confusing anyway, and that's so easy to get lost. So, yeah, it, it could be that we see some data now from the previous run. So I haven't, this time I haven't powered off the board. Uh, I, I just hit reset, right? So when you do that, um, 
then data in DRAM can still be present. So, yeah, and unless you actively remove it or, you know, the DRAM controller would do it. So I'm ready to press the reset button again. And here we go. So apparently we do not see any data at the bottom. Initially, we had all zero, which is interesting, right? So this should have been all F. And uh, what I'm doing now is, now I'm changing the DRAM base address, uh, like the load address again to load from the uncacheable space. And now let's see again what happens this time. I am expecting now that we would actually see something down here. And now what makes this interesting is um, maybe we shouldn't see that because uh, we hadn't arrived there yet. But it could also that the um, you know serial output being printed here is actually really just so far behind that uh, you know we were already done with the copying process and just hadn't noticed. So yeah, um, wh when you do this much logging, it's actually uh, uh, slowing you down by far because compared to DRAM, uh, serial is actually very very slow. Okay, and uh, we're running again. Oh. This year is like a missing bit somewhere. So we're we're not seeing full data down here, but but somehow something <laughs> has made it in here, which is weird, right? So yeah, I uh, stopped the process somewhere in between at this point. Let's actually see. Uh, what it was like initially. So yeah, this is before running everything. Uh, we're seeing all Fs here. However, we're not printing as much as in between here. Uh, I, I just added a bunch more offsets. But yeah, we, we already had this here, uh, which is filled with an E. Hmm. Let's just double check if this is even an address I was uh, testing. So should that have received a value? That is uh, 2E4500, and let's check the range uh, that we're writing to. So we're writing in this range from 0 to 80K. Huh, interesting. That isn't even a region we would be uh, touching with or testing. Interesting. Or should we hang on a second? Um, oh, right. We actually we actually have to multiply with four um, because we're we're testing like four bytes at a time, and this here is actually not a. Uh, I, I shouldn't really call the start and end uh, because that's not exactly what it is. Um, it's actually a quarter of that. Okay, hang on a second. So four times this year would be two O quad zero, right? And uh, this year is beyond. Two. So that would be this address here. And here we're going beyond. Now I'm doing one more thing. Um, so uh, I wanted to see also what it ha what happens like when you you know not just write to some uh, consequent uh, uh, addresses but also like somewhere else further behind and stuff. And so let's check here. So I'm also writing to 4K behind. So, mm, but even then, 4K behind here would be. 201,000 hex. So we would never be in this area. So I don't know how this here actually happened. I'm not even sure if DRAM should be initialized with all F or all zero. So let's do the following. 
Um, here, before running uh, the DRAM test, uh, let's maybe also let's maybe also do a dump. So, huh? Let's do the following. So instead of doing the test in here, let's actually move that code over to our main stage so that we can easily do something in between. I will put it here. So we have DRAM in it. Uh, whoopsie. So I had it to my buffer. Anyway, so let's do that again. Uh, let's put it here. And now in the meantime, actually let's move the constant definitions up a bit uh, so that we can use them. So in the in the time in between, let's do a bit more of a debug print this year. So now we can see uh, what the memory is filled with before running the DRAM test, right? And now what I would need to do is I would need to expose this function. So this is now a public function. And here we say DRAM, DRAM test. All right. Now to make sure that we're not spoiling the experiment again, I'm turning off the board. And so, yeah, now the memory should be empty again. And we're transferring again. So yeah, it's, it's a bit unfortunate uh, that we got stuck at this point. Uh, but yeah, we do need to get the cacheable memory to work because otherwise, um, you know, our operating system won't really work properly, especially at Linux. I mean, it could technically run in the uh, uncacheable space, but yeah, it would be very, very slow. And uh, I guess it's not even configured for that. I think it's really just uh, made for running uh, from this uh, one address I told you about. Okay, this here is interesting again. We're seeing the same. We're seeing the same E here. Oh, oh hang on a second. Hang on a second. This is interesting. So initially, we're here. So initially, our memory is filled with some random data. Now, should we expect this to be filled? I'm really not an expert with DRAM, so I can't really tell. Um, but what we do know now is at least some of those values, you know, they are, were already there. So the phenomenon that we were seeing, um, that is not a fragment or, or leftover from like uh, testing uh, the DRAM or something. It, it already happens even before uh, we start our test. So yeah, now, we do fill this with all these F's here in our test. And well, then, then we start filling it up. And now the question is, do we uh, like, wh wh what is left to do for us? I'm already a bit unsure now, so yeah. Um, I just wanted to update you on this procedure anyway. So uh, just for the uh, further announcement, um, let's end this here at this point. So, you know, uh, we're, we're now dealing with, um, you know, horrible stuff and uh, it's, it's really hard to debug. I will try to uh, walk through the code again and see, you know, if I can find some issues or whatever, uh, like uh, with the translation. It's unfortunately not very, very trivial, uh, but um, 
well it's uh it's also mostly just a matter of time and uh, you know authority reading again so there were a few things only i had to translate to rest so like a, a, a few um a few places where there was actual logic uh, otherwise it was really just um you know find and replace for uh a bunch of uh, calls to uh, functions that are really just writing to register. So, yeah, I just um, defined my own helper functions for that and then ju just did some find and replace, and that was it. All right. Um, next week, uh, I will be streaming again, but that will then be the last stream for this year. I mean, as you can see, it's uh, already the end of the year almost anyway, because um, uh, in, in two weeks, uh, we will have the end of the year event here in Germany for uh, you know from lots of different hackerspaces. Uh, it could also be that other uh, neighboring countries are participating a bit. Um, anyway, so it will be a uh, very much virtual event, but I will be giving a few talks. Uh, one of them on Orboot, unfortunately in German. So yeah, we'll have to see. It might be that uh, there will be also a translation live, but I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, and otherwise, uh, yeah, next year, if uh, we cannot really finish this up here, I think I will uh, start a new chapter at some point, and uh, yeah, we'll keep you posted in the social networks. But yeah, let's see you again next week. Um, if we don't get uh, past this issue here, then yeah, let's uh, move on to the next chip. Or maybe do a bit of uh, another project or something else. Maybe work with uh, QMU here for you know uh, drafting a bit more of features in Orboot. Uh, there is a few interesting things I can think about uh, when it comes to loading operating systems. Um, and we might actually want to experiment with a few custom operating systems that we make. Anyway, yeah. Uh, long story short, thank you very much again. And I will see you next week. Take care. Bye.